All right, welcome everybody. Glad everyone could be here this evening as we're all getting set up and getting our videos on. I'll introduce myself. My name is Marina Mails. I'm the executive director of York Ready for Climate Action, a grassroots organization here in New York that uh, many of you have probably heard of. I see some friendly faces who are volunteers with YRCA here already. Um, we are co-hosting this series with York Public Library and the York Land Trust. Um, if you go on the library's website, uh, it's called uh, Living in a Climate Changed World, and you can find the list of the rest of the eight programs that are in the series, uh, including our Climate Action Fair, which is coming up on March 23rd, Saturday, March 23rd at York High School from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. That's going to be a great opportunity for folks to learn all about different ways to get involved. Um, so I'm putting my shameless plug in here right at the beginning. But we're here together tonight on Zoom to talk about um, what local and state efforts are happening to, to take on climate change, which is moving faster than many of us imagined would ever happen. And we're experiencing the effects of it right here in New York with warmer winters, less snow, more frequent flooding and strong storms, intense rain events. Um, and of course the storms that we had a couple of months ago that, that did so much damage to our coastal areas. So we're lucky enough in our town to have both local and state governments that are committed to reducing emissions. And during the next hour, we're going to hear from Taylor McGuire of the Town of York Planning Office and Representative Jerry Ronte of Maine's 146th House District to learn about latest steps to combat global warming uh, locally and across the state. We'll have about 10 minutes or so at the end for questions. And so if you'll if you think of questions while folks are speaking, go ahead and put them in the chat box and then I'll call on you uh, toward the end of the presentation so that you can ask them. Um, I'm gonna read a bio of Taylor and a bio of Jerry just to introduce them so you can get to know them a little bit better. Taylor McGuire is a planning professional with a strong background in urban ecology, data analysis and community engagement. In her current role as environmental planner for the town of York, She's working to implement the town's climate action and comprehensive plans. Her previous roles include global experience as an ecological impact analyst, where she was responsible for designing and implementing mangrove restoration and climate resiliency projects along Cambodia's southern coast. She's worked for the University of Utah, performing active transportation planning and helping to upgrade their climate action plan at the Utah Inland Port Authority with data analysis and GIS, Policy work for both the Utah Association of Special Districts and the 2022 Utah State Legislative Ses Session. And a designer and educator at off-grid passive solar design build firm, Earthship Biotexture. Biotexture, I'm not gonna say that right. Uh, that sounds really cool though. I, uh, I'm interested to learn more about that, Taylor. In addition to her professional experience, Taylor is a staff sergeant with the 19th Special Forces Airborne Army National Guard after actively serving with the 300th Military Intelligence Brigade. Her occupational specialty as a chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear non-commissioned officer lends to her depth of knowledge in hazardous waste operations and EPA regulations. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, it's good to be here. <laughs> Jerry Ronte is a state representative for House District 146 in Maine, which includes Western York, Seacoast Wells, and the town of Agunquit. He serves on the Joint Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Technology, the Maine Climate Council, and on the board of the Hydrogen Energy Center. In York, he was a member of the planning board, the Energy Steering Committee, and co-chaired the Climate Action Plan Steering Committee. Prior to moving to York, Jerry had a 47-year career equally split between the electric utility and clean energy sectors. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate you both being here. So I'll ask Jerry to speak first to orient us as to what climate action has taken place in recent months on the state level and what challenges and opportunities he's seeing. Uh, so you can get started, Jerry, whenever you're ready. All righty, well, thanks, Marina. Um, I, you can hear me, yes? Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm sitting in an office in the state house because our committee meeting is still going on. So otherwise I'd have been dressed down. Um, and it's intimidating to uh, to to share the stage with uh, a Green Beret sergeant. Um, <clears throat> so um, there's been an awful lot of activity from the legislative level uh, here at the state house. If you're if you're not aware, 
a session of, of the legislature is a two-year uh, affair. The first session is uh, runs January through late June, and then the second session runs from January to mid-April. We're in the second se session now. So a considerable amount of work got done in that first, um, first year chunk. Uh, and we're still doing stuff, um, still, doing, still doing things right now. Um, it's run the gamut of different kinds of activities that have an impact on various pieces of implementing the climate action plan, new initiatives and new studies that look at interesting things, um, dealing with uh, um, uh, programs that uh, assist low-income uh, customers with, with energy costs. Um, so to name some, we passed a bill that has EV rebates for medium-duty um, vehicles. And that's targeted to uh, businesses. And the, the way it will work is uh, it, the, the amount of funding goes half to uh, businesses with 50 or less employees, and then larger larger uh, businesses can also take advantage. There's an e-bike uh, rebate program. That one is specifically tailored to uh, nonprofit organizations who then would find appropriate um, uh, lower income people who have a real need for a bike so that's not just you know to the general public to uh, to get e-bikes a study on beneficial electrification that that's one of the key elements of the climate action plan in the state what it means is essentially electrify transportation and electrify building heat so that's electric vehicles electric vehicle charging and it's um, and it's the heat pump program. The heat pump program, as you may be aware, has been really successful. We've got over a hundred thousand out there now, and there are new goals for uh, for more. Um, fixing the the process by which solar developers get compensated for the power that they develop. Um, there had been a growing problem with. Uh, a disconnect in terms of how much these uh, developers, these projects, community solar projects, for example, were getting versus what the value of that energy was. And the differential in that cost was going to be borne by ratepayers. Uh, we passed a bill that uh, adjusted that method and, and, and really set the path for new projects putting them in a, a scheme where um, they're compensated on something that looks more like real value. Um, I got a bill passed that has the PUC looking at offering time of use rates for um, standard offer supply. Uh, unless you're in a, a community solar project or um, have picked a competitive supplier, you're you're in the standard offer, the sort of default uh, supply for most customers in the state, and it's roughly ninety percent of residential customers are standard offer. Every year, the PUC goes out for bids, and they come up with um, um, they come up with a price, and that's what you pay for the entire year. The reality, though, is that uh, the the value of the electricity you use actually varies all the time. Um, every five minutes is the way it's measured. <clears throat> and, um, and it also varies depending on where you are. In some states, the way this would work would be the utility would offer four or five different periods where the price of electricity would change. And at peak periods, it's more expensive um, off peak, it's it's less, and and the idea is that it offers customers the opportunity to change the way it, they use electricity um, to save money on the one hand, and if they avoid the high cost periods, that helps um, uh, the utility because the most expensive power comes in at at those peak periods. Um, 
a project that started last session and that we're still working on now is a very large land-based wind project that is going to be constructed in northern Maine. It's if you if if, if this number makes sense to you, it's 1.2 gigawatts. That's um, almost two Maine Yankees. Um, so that's that's in in process. And like all of these projects, one of the the biggest challenges is the transmission line. I mean, how do you get it here? Um, Efficiency Maine is working on a home energy scoring system to evaluate uh, energy efficiency. Um, um, a bill was passed to use contaminated land to promote solar, especially uh, PFAS, but not just that. Um, there was a bill for clean energy pilot. There's an energy storage strategy that's just getting underway and being evaluated at the PUC in terms of promoting local energy storage that can begin to start saving that solar that you know only comes when the sun shines. This way you can you can have output at different hours of the day. Um, there's a huge project for offshore wind. And that is almost three times the capacity of what we're talking about for the land-based wind. Uh, that'll that'll um, Two weeks ago, the the governor just announced that uh, in Searsport, there's a state-owned island where a fairly significant industrial facility is going to be built to uh, construct these wind turbines and um, uh, and get them out offshore and, and hooked up. Um, there were two um, failures that I was not very excited about, but. Uh, there was a bill to pre-wire um, pre commercial industrial buildings if they were putting in a new parking lot for EV chargers. Um, that one failed. And then there was another one, believe it or not, that simply said, if you're building a new commercial roof, uh, you reserve 40% of its space for solar. It doesn't say you have to go do it, but um, um, it 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 it. it gives you the option later <clears throat> without a lot of ex extra expense uh, and that one didn't work but overall it's been um it's been a very active now year and a half and i think uh, uh quite a bit of accomplishment did i take too long <laughs> no that that was just right um yeah thank you you we have one question i'll go ahead and um and ask it now since we have some time here um, from Kiki Tidwell. Yay on time of use rates bill, but disconnect between utilities and solar farm production. Couldn't the utility solve this by employing their own batteries and selling the power at better power rate times? My utilities are not allowed to own batteries. Okay. Not in Maine. Uh, and there's a proceeding underway at the PUC right now, actually, that um, is trying to figure out if there are certain circumstances where utility might be allowed to own energy generation or energy storage. Okay. Um, and, and by the way, saving the disconnect was you're dealing with two different pricing regimes. Solar projects got a flat um reimbursement per kilowatt hour that was equal to the retail rate they were getting the same rate you know you pay for a kilowatt hour they were getting that for the kilowatt hour they produce problem is that those kilowatt hours you know, our utilities are not allowed to own generation or keep hold of, of that power so they immediately hand it off to the wholesale power market that's you know, an entirely different environment, and um, it's only about a third of what retail rates are. So that cost differential um, was was beginning to create a problem, and we think we've got a solution. Okay. Um, Jerry, I'm curious if there's a particular bill that was passed or a bill that's being considered that you're particularly excited about that you find to be, you know, impactful. Um, that we should have on our radar. You may have just mentioned it, but you could say it again. Yeah, I well, the, the there's three actually. Um, one is the 
uh, the bill that begins to get the state offering time of use rates for the supply part of your bill. Um, many people aren't aware, at least in CMP, the part of the bill the utility does control, there is a kind of time of use rates. It essentially only has two different rates. So it's it's very limited in terms of how much impact it could really have. And for a lot of people, it doesn't make sense. This gets us to a time of use rate regime, which is uh, part of the way to really valuing electricity um, at, at, at its true value. The, the other piece that is not quite there yet is where that electricity is generated <clears throat> or where that electricity is used varies a lot by location, but that's a complexity we're not dealing with right now. Um, the second thing is, is a bill that hasn't been passed yet. It's left committee and will go to the floor. To, well, it'll go to the floor in the next week or two, actually. Uh, should it get passed, what it does is um, it sets up a process within the PUC where they begin to look at how utilities charges, or what utilities make, how that influences their performance. And so uh, it will over time shift um, a rate structure that's currently the, the way it works is utilities say, this is how much we need. And the PUC looks at it and says, well, let's moderate this and moderate that. They come up with a number and then you divide through how many kilowatts hours you expect to be generating and bingo, that's the number that comes out on your bill. The way this would work would be, um, there's an absolute minimum that they have to get. It's constitutional that, that they get a minimum amount of a return um, or coverage of their costs. But then, um, then everything, the automatic light system in this office just went off. Um, <laughs> everything else above that uh, will be based on a bunch of metrics that measure how that utility performs. We're talking about reliability. We're talking about billing accuracy. We're talking about customer service, efficiency use of, uh, of investments, how well they're doing in interconnections, how well they're doing in complying with um, greenhouse gas emission issues where they can have an impact. It's a, the process will establish a set of goals like that and then come up with a, a, a methodology where the, the recovery they get for what they put into the system is based on how they perform. So that'll be very interesting. It'll take some time for really to have an impact um, but it, it's the regulatory, you know, if people are dissatisfied with how their utilities are performing, then, um, um, th these, there are regulatory tools there that, um, that can be used to, to essentially modify their behavior to where you want them to be. Okay. So, and the third thing is, mm -hmm. and this is just about to get started. Um, I got a bill that's that has the state doing a study that looks at a very different way the grid operates at the local level. <clears throat> and by that, I mean, the grid that we have now essentially is the same as, as 100 years ago. It was meant as a one-way delivery system, big power plants, bring power down, they come to end users and the energy gets consumed. But in the last 10 or 15 years, things have shifted a lot. Now with local generation, it becomes a two-way system. There's technologies out there that can really fine tune how the power flows go that, that reduce the amount of power you need to serve the, 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 all of this load. There's different ways to, to control how people use electricity, not just like in, in this time of the use rates, but also 
um, how the the equipment in their their homes functions. So it's a very different approach to grid modernization. And in a nutshell, it's kind of like saying, you know, we're taking a one-way delivery system and now we're making it into a computer network where you can really fine tune it and, and adjust it. Um, and, and you have now the capability to know what's going on in real time every few minutes because of things like smart meters. So, um, um, putting something like this into place, it's, it's pretty complex. Uh, it's going to take probably a year for people to come up with a, a potential way this might be done in Maine, but it's, it's, it's like the, the 21st century grid is really what it's trying to design and, and change the way we're doing things. So those are the three things. Um, you know, I've been focused on grid modernization and, and rates basically in terms of my own personal activity uh, um, in, in the legislature. Thank you. And, and thank you for staying in the weeds, the very thick weeds of this issue so that you can understand uh, these all of these details and help us uh, understand it as well. And Jerry, if you have bill numbers that um, might guide us if we wanted to look something up, if you could put those in the chat. That would be great um, for many of the things sure. that you were talking about. And my last question before you, for you before we move on to Taylor is, um, as advocates ourselves, those who are here on the call, what um, what should we be doing? What should we be paying attention to or calling our legislators about um, either other of the things you're talking about or other issues to be to be most impactful? Yeah. Um, well, let me do a screen share here. Um, this is number one, and that is talking to people. This was a, a study that was done last, I don't know, October or so. And the question basically was, um, if, if is climate number one in terms of your priority and how you vote? Um, these were the answers that they got. And the, the national numbers are over here, and this is Maine. And so talking to people over 65, um, you know, those people are pretty much already there. But it's the next cohort down and then the mid-30s to mid-40s group that are much less concerned about climate. And these are the people that need to be reached in terms of what voters you talk to if the interest is to generate support for continuing climate initiatives. It's a little easier now because of a lot of the, the evidence that we're seeing on an almost daily basis. Um, um, in fact, the... Um, if you look at at uh, storm damage, for example, and I'm I'm sure Taylor may mention this as well. Um, CMP just put in 162 million rate requests for storm restoration for calendar 2023. That doesn't include our more, most recent storms. And if you look at storm damage um, over the last few years in Maine, it was. 37 million in 2019, 71 million in 2020, 120 million in 2022, and 161 million last year. And that's not including utility stuff. So, um, and the two January storms seem to be on the neighborhood of $70 million. So, you know, there's a growing and real economic impact here. And whether you buy into the science of climate, um, this is genuine evidence that um, things need to be done. The second thing is, um, back to, um, the second thing is this, and and you know, I'm I'm sure some of you are aware of this, but. There are some things that have a whole lot more impact 
than others. And if you're talking about households and individuals, you know, this is Project Drawdown. I'm sure a couple of you have read the book. Um, but if you look at it, it's 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 diets and food waste, number one and two, then distributed solar. Uh, so you're getting into energy and then you're into insulation for housing, lighting, um, and you can go down the list. I'll, you know, I'm glad to send this out. Um, but it's it's taking a careful look at what the things are that um, that people can can do on their own. Um, you know, continue to change the form of energy you use to less fossil. Shift to when you use that energy and make its use as, as efficiently as possible. I mean, those are the big, big ones. Um, um, but I think at a local level, that's where it can go. I, there's a bunch of things that has to happen way above the local level. Um, we have to change the, the mix of sources of electricity that uh, are used in our six state region. That's, that's the regional grid. Um, a lot of people don't realize that what you, when you plug in to your wall socket, what comes out is actually a blend of everything that's in New England at the moment. And half of that is natural gas. And so as long as that's the case, if you're trying to mitigate carbon by electrification, the most you can mitigate is limited by how much natural gas is in that six state mix. And so everything that can be done to offset natural gas, and obviously you're not gonna do that at personal level, um, has, a, has a huge impact on, on, on the efforts you make to use electricity instead of fossil. Um, you know, we're working on that. Um, the six state region is a little bit of a, um, it's, uh, most states are very motivated, but there's no central coordination of how, how the planning forward goes. And, and that's something that we need to do. Right. Jerry, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. If you have questions for Jerry, you can put them in the chat and we'll take them at the end. But uh, now well, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Taylor. Just, just oh. one more thing real quick. Okay. Um, you hear people say, oh, I don't know what solar does. This is precisely what solar does in terms of reducing costs. And this is the, the hourly use of electricity in the six states yesterday. And you can see the high peaks are at 7.30 in the morning and at 7.30 at night. The, the one that drops down is the actual demand that happened. The line up here is what that demand would have been if there wasn't rooftop solar. And everything in between here that's been avoided would have been natural gas. Hmm. the most expensive form of natural gas. And so, you know, it's a little misleading because if you look at the left scale, it starts at 8,000. So the whole graph is a, a little bigger. So this is a little smaller, but nonetheless, you know, there's only 7% only of generation in the six state region is renewables. And that's the impact that you're seeing. So um, that's why in that prioritization chart, you know, the third thing down is distributed solar um, photovoltaic. So anyway, uh, I don't want to That's take great. time away from, from Taylor here. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. Okay, Taylor, um, Jerry, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, perfect. Um, Taylor, go ahead and, and tell us about what's going on in York. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so York is a really unique position right now, um, just because of all the momentum that we've had. So our climate action plan was approved um, May of 2022, and my role with the town is actually a result of that plan. Um, I've only been here, it's been just under five months. Um, there are 52 goals in the town's climate action plan, and I'm kind of trying to 
plan all of them accordingly. Um, a lot of them have a lot of overlap um, and a lot of these interrelationships. That's really, really critical when we're talking about climate action is, is who is actually going to be able to help us move these things forward. And it's always going to be a collaborative effort. Um, so just in the past five months, some of the things that um, we've done, the select board unanimously um, approved the single-use plastics reduction ordinance to be on the ballot in May. So um, everyone local can see that on the ballot in May. That'll help, I think, I hope it's going to have a pretty drastic reduction um, in the summertime as we see a lot of the summer populations come in, some of the tourist populations come in. Um, I have developed a, a policy on the sustainability fund, and I've edited the application a little bit, which will hopefully make it a lot easier for everyone to understand what those funds are and to be able to actually acquire those funds for use um, so that the town can benefit some more community projects. We want to be able to fund climate initiatives that are taking place in the town. And then again, just a lot of that collaboration and networking um, it doesn't seem as exciting because there's not like any tangible evidence to show people when you have a strong network of relationships. But I really want to emphasize that the goals in the climate action plan can't be achieved with just one role. You know, it's not going to be whether that's coming from me or a state level or just the select board in general. It's not going to be any one person that's going to be able to achieve any of these climate action goals. Um, collaboration is critical. So we need public-private partnerships. We need collaboration between state and local and regional partnerships, different organizations um, like Efficiency Maine and YRCA and, um, you know, Climate Action Fair is going to be a great opportunity for everybody. So we've got a lot of things that we're working on right now. Um, several town committees are, are either actively working on projects or trying to figure out logistics for aspiring projects. Um, I've I've heard I'm I'm don't want to make any plugs for um, any projects here, but so we're looking into townwide composting, um, a pilot project for that, analyzing recreational use of the York River and its preservation, trying to separate maybe some of the motorboat and paddle craft usage with a more preserved area so that we're protecting those delicate grasses, waterfowl, migratory birds, that sort of thing. Um, while still being able to to enjoy that nature and, and be able to use that space. Um, some different preservation projects. I've been in some discussions with um, the New England Historic Preservation Society actually reached out to me for some of our buildings. That's a whole regional partnership that we're working on, making sure we're maintaining our character of place while still making sure that these buildings and um, heritage and, and historic areas are preserved for the future um, without causing any kind of adverse impacts or anything like that. Um, I've had a few members of the public express interest in a tree protection ordinance. Um, and then like Jerry said, solar is very important. We've been looking at putting solar panels on some of our underused or um, limited use lands, potentially some other town buildings. So momentum's really only grown in York lately. Um, I think this is a really good moment right now um, to really get on board. You you kind of asked Jerry, you know, what can people do to be more involved? And climate action needs people. Uh, it needs involvement from every level, whether it's just volunteers or organizations or committees. So if you're interested um, in, in what you can do and trying to utilize some of your talents, there is space for you. Um, I'm gonna put my information in the chat so that people can reach out to me, see where maybe some of their, their passions and their talents might lie um, because there's we, we just need people right now um, to, to kind of move all of these goals forward. So I kind of wanted to talk about impacts and costs of climate action, um, not just monetary, but in my mind, climate action really has two categories, um, direct impacts and indirect impacts. So a direct impact is something that would alter a situation immediately. If you take the example of some of the, the storm flooding um, that Jerry mentioned, a direct impact might be that you have you know, significant water damage to your home or that your power is knocked out. Um, you know, you have to plan ahead some of your grocery trips. Maybe you have to shelter in place. These are all direct immediate impacts that those people are going to feel. 
indirect impacts are anything that might alter your habits over time, but tend to go unnoticed because of their gradual increase. So using the same example of stormwater or flooding, maybe this flood damages the housing and the roads and other infrastructure so often and severe that over time, these amenities are no longer viable for us to use. So now we have a small population of people that we still need to fill those needs and they're still trying to use the resources that are available. So this is gonna bring up a lot of capacity issues, um, a, a higher competition for resources. So this could be reflected in the costs of different amenities. Housing is already pretty tight in York um, for a myriad of reasons, but now picture everyone living within a quarter mile of the beaches trying to fit into the housing market that's more inland. The prices are going to go up because the demand in that situation is much higher, and so we're also going to be seeing a lot more development, too, to try and meet that demand. So because of this interconnected network, um, it's really hard to put a cost on some of these indirect impacts, and so that's why I think um, this position is amazing. I'm, I'm super glad to be here because it's partnering that environmental and sustainability aspect with the planning aspect um, because it's it's just so interconnected in everything you're going to see when it when it comes to um, housing, when it comes to costs of even smaller things like costs of grocery, costs of fuel, um, cost of utilities. Those are all things that are going to be directly impacted by climate change. Thank you. Um, is there anything that you're particularly excited about that you've heard um, plans for, or that you're you know hoping to to push forward in town? Um, yeah, so I mentioned collaboration. Is it is it going to be a huge factor for success? Nothing happens in a vacuum. Um, so any achievement of these climate goals are going to rely heavily on stakeholders working together. Um, this event is a great example. Jerry and I have the opportunity to share information from our perspective levels, but without collaboration um, with the library or Ready for Climate Action, we wouldn't be here today. So it takes a community to heal a community. Um, I'm looking into, you know, we always need to be expanding these relationships of trust between these various stakeholders, and then the actual action itself, implementation of these things, um, putting pressure on decision-making bodies to follow through with a lot of these concepts, and making sure that, you know, any public body, any decision-making body knows that this is something that the public is interested in, it's something that they want, and it's something that they support. Um, so uh, I mentioned a couple committees earlier. Um, we've got openings on several committees um, from the town that are working on climate action. Um, the climate action committee in particular, there are a lot of openings on that committee. We're always looking for passionate people to join uh, or even those interested to participate in a working group. So you don't have to be an official member of the committee, but if you'd like to participate in a working group, that could be beneficial if you can't make a long-term commitment. Um, I also mentioned that a few members of the public reached out because they wanted to create a tree protection ordinance. This is also how the plastic ban um, ordinance came to fruition. Some student activists came before the select board with the idea. So if you're passionate about something and you don't currently know how to get started working on it, reach out to me if there are plans in place. Um, I can align you with different groups and figures and, and again, see where you fit best. And so for me, the exciting part is just trying to lay out all, all 52 of these goals and, and really try to knock them down. That's my primary role here in New York is just trying to achieve all of the goals on the climate action plan. Thanks, Taylor. Um, Kiki Tidwell, who is on the climate action committee, um, head of the climate action committee has just mentioned a few things in the chat. Kiki, would you wanna go ahead and talk about what the committee has done so far? I can get you off of mute here, sorry, one second. Um, you know, I'll defer you... to Wayne Boardman, uh, but we have had uh, four meetings and we've passed four large actions, including a uh, updated building code that's going to be very um, uh, energy saving for the town. So, Wayne, do you have anything to uh, add? Hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Or we can. Uh, yeah, um, I, I would 
I would just echo what uh, what Taylor said. There's a lot that we can do still, and the and the Climate Action Committee is looking at um, the major each of the major actions that are laid out in the Climate Action Plan, and we're trying to um, uh, either look if there's some immediate actions or look to see if there's some, uh, as as Taylor talked about, other collaboratives that we can work with. We have. Um, as individual members and a group, we have spoken separately with a number of different committees in town, um, and uh, as well as uh, um, the director of public works, um, the superintendent of the, of the sewer district and the water district, and um, and again, we're 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 really at the stage now where we're looking to gather information and to um, continue making improvements that have already been started. Um, as Taylor mentioned, these working groups that she's talking about, there could be a specific project, like for instance, improving pedestrian access in town or um, you know, a number of different smaller actions um, having to do with, um, with tree, tree growth, for instance. And, and as she said, they don't have to be a long-term commitment, but if you're, if somebody out there is, is, is interested or passionate about a particular um, aspect of climate climate change, whether it's the mitigation part or the adaptation part of it, just you know, give her your name, and and we'll we'll be glad to to uh, you know include anybody that's interested in in the projects that we're we're moving towards. And of course, a lot of what um, has to be done also has to be done through. Uh, uh, ordinances in the zoning, and and we're continuing to look at those as well. Some of those may require some public input, similar to what's happening uh, for the York Beach Greenway and the, on Short Sands Road. So, again, this we're we're only at the beginning, but uh, we're we're uh, we're we're glad to have people participate, and we're we're very lucky to have Taylor on board. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm thinking about this and I, I feel like um, from my college politics course, I understand how bills are passed on a state level, um, but nothing like that could have prepared me for how bills are passed in New York. Um, it's so very different. And I'm wondering if um, Taylor or Wayne or somebody uh, would like to just walk us through how it will happen that we can perhaps get solar panels on a rooftop or uh electric car charging or what some some of these measures. Um, what are the steps that need to be taken in order to pass that? And how can the public be involved in, um, in voicing their opinions about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you have an idea for something like that, first thing is to make sure that you're reaching out to the stakeholders, uh, making sure they're on board. Um, I'll take the example of um, Solar on the on the fire station. We've done some preliminary efforts in reaching out to them. They're on board. We would now go to the select board with a request for action um, and kind of give them the the background and the details of that. They would then approve us for submitting uh, a request for proposals. We would write that and then push it out so that it's an equal process for any contractor trying to apply to put that solar on the roof. We bring all the different bids to the select board. They kind of vote on which is best um, with the inclusion of, of our opinions and our feedback and what we think fits the needs of both the project and the people that are ultimately going to end up using it. So whether that's some kind of share project for the town as a whole, or whether it's just an individual user, which would be the firehouse or um, however we best decide to do that. Um, and then we we get the funding and and um, move forward. So it really, it depends. That is just sort of a project. Um, if it's something like an ordinance, for example, it has to go through several drafts, several public hearings. So there are lots of different avenues for how we can kind of tackle climate change. It doesn't always have to be, um, you know, a vote on a ballot ordinance is due. Uh, it just depends on, on whether we're trying to aim for, you know, ordinances, projects, uh, adoption of codes, these sorts of things. Great, great. And um, if, if anyone has questions, please do put them in the chat box. Um, Kiki mentions that they have, the Climate Action Committee has gone to the select board for action on the solar on the fire station roof uh, with, a with a formal request from the CAC. Um, that sounds great. Um, curious, 
Taylor and Jerry, uh, what what challenges you're seeing in getting things passed and getting work done? Um, if you could just briefly speak to some of maybe the frustrations and challenges that you're trying to overcome. Um, either one of you can go first and jump in. You can tackle that one first, Jerry. <laughs> um, well, the biggest challenge is that uh, there's a lot of people who don't quite get it yet. Um, it relates to you know the slide earlier in terms of of getting people to appreciate the urgency, but I have to tell you there is a very substantial portion of people who do not accept the science and and it was kind of a shock to me, but I don't know two weeks ago there was a resolution um, before the the house that simply supported the recommendations of COP28. And it prompted an hour of three to five minute speeches from Republicans about what a hoax and a myth all of this stuff was. Um, you hear it over and over again. Um, and, and it's become, what I see is, is even, is really uh, obstructionist um, from the standpoint of there are active efforts at every turn to block solar, block it when that bill went through uh, to adjust how compensation was um, is being managed. There was an opposing bill that looked like it was an adjustment method too, but the a fundamental effect of it would have been to shut down solar completely uh, other than rooftop uh, in the state. Um, the uh, These wind projects are constantly fought. And, and in the absence of, this is really maybe an important element here come November, in the absence of a democratic governor and democratic majority in the House and Senate, a lot of this stuff would never have gotten done because had there been Republican majorities, those people that you that I mentioned about COP28, they're there to stop everything. Um, um, they don't have solutions. They just have, you know, no, 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 no. <laughs> the lights are Thank on. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> Jerry yeah. in the dark again. Um, yeah, that points to the importance of voting, uh, which we know is one of the most powerful things that we can do. Um, Taylor, how about you as far as challenges? Um, I'll sort of echo that sentiment. I'll say that I haven't run into um, too many climate change um, deniers or, or disagreeers in York. Um, everybody's been pretty wonderful at, at the town level, but maybe they just aren't... Um, as involved as I wish they were. I've been harping on collaboration a lot, and a lot of it is because I'm I'm the only environmental position in the town. Um, and so a lot of it ends up falling to me. A lot of people are looking to me, especially because it is such a new role, expecting me to roll out everything on my own. Um, and then being part of the planning department, I still have people calling and asking about like permitting on wetlands and, um, you know, so it's it's hard to try and divvy up the work between various committees that I've been helping to staff, um, code department, um, or our other town planners that have been great to work with, um, and trying to get people, I would say people are already interested, but get them involved in a meaningful way where it's not just um, suggestion of ideas where people really feel empowered. Um, and as a staff, you know, as, a, as an employee of the town, I want to make sure that people are feeling empowered and, and helping guide them through the process so that it becomes more of a, a sustainable effort on the town itself. So when I say sustainable, I mean it in, in the true definition of the word of something that we can sustain long term, um, where people know the process, they know how to make change, and they can feel empowered if they have an idea, they can come forward and just work forward and, and not have to rely on anyone else to sort of do these steps for them. Great, thank you. Um, Kiki, I'm curious if you could share either in the chat or out loud what you're sharing with us in the chat box. It looks like some visuals, but they're too small for me to see. 
So we uh, have the climate action plan on a scorecard now, and I am dropping in the actions that we have taken as the climate action committee, and also which other agencies have taken, like the York Land Trust was able to get more conservation lands committed, and the um, uh, sewer department was able to get a grant recently uh, through um, uh, Pingree, Shelley Pingree. Um, and so we're trying to keep a track of all the different positive actions that are happening that relate to sections of the climate action plan. Um, I we, I've submitted it to the town as our current report of what we've been accomplishing. So maybe uh, it has been posted there and you can access it there. I don't know a better way to share it right now unless you want me to share my screen. Oh, that's good. I imagine I could click on it and it would get bigger, but I think that I'm, I'm worried it will mess up something with the Zoom, so I didn't want to click on it. Thanks for explaining it. And it sounds like it may end up on the um, town website at some point. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thank you, Kiki. Um, okay. So last question. I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat right now, so I'll ask another one. Um, so much of this is granular and you know, tiny step by tiny step to get us toward progress. Some of what you're talking about, Jerry, is so complex um, that we kind of forget we're in a conversation about climate change because the details are so so dense. I'm wondering if we can take kind of an opposite uh, view and look at big picture, what what it is you are envisioning that we're working toward. How How is Maine going to work as a state when your job is done? Um, and Taylor, how is what is York going to look like as a town when you can you know, dust off your hands and say, I, I, my work is done here. Um, and and what kind of benefits for everyday Mainers will we see as a result? Um, you know, obviously we'll be helping reduce climate change, but maybe there are other things too that would be positives. Um, so not to put you on the spot, but do either of you have a response to that? Yeah, I can dive in there and say, um, when you are planning for your most vulnerable communities, everyone is going to benefit. Um, so if we're, you know, I would love to work myself out of a job. That would be great. Um, and if we get to the point where we we have this utopia um, where we have amazing natural resources that we can benefit from that are gorgeous and protected and we can all enjoy them and um, we have nice walkable environments and, and we have a strong sense of community and we're really supporting a lot of our um, local businesses, locally made things, um, keeping our footprint smaller, you know, everybody eating a, a great local terrian diet. Mm -hmm. um, all that's going to do is get other people interested in York and, and make them go, these people have such a great quality of life. And, and we already see that York's already such a desirable place to live. And so it really becomes management at that point. You know, how do we become a, a leader in this and, and do it for ourselves, but also encourage other towns, other municipalities, surrounding areas to do it for themselves. Um, and how can we do that in a just and equitable way to make sure that we're benefiting some of those lower populations so that everyone overall has a better quality of life? Thanks. How about you, Jerry? Is there a sort of a vision that you can describe for us? Um. Yeah, I, I mean, I what 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 you what you've heard and 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 what I've seen is, the state of Maine has done in the last five years, an incredible amount of of different initiatives, all under the general rubric of climate action. Um, some of it, I think, maybe came on a little too fast without putting some of the other pieces together that needed to be done. But we as a state are um, extraordinarily well positioned now um, to begin to, to, to really make the best use of all the things that have been done. So what I'd love to see is... Um, and an end at the state level of um, 
this incremental um, targets of opportunity. Let's go do this. Let's go do this, and and move towards a much more comprehensive plan that's that's well put together. And 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 that is in fact happening out of the governor's energy office. Um, but the big things to me are, in order to get to where we want to go, to order to get this decarbonized world that we need to see. Um, you know, we're we're doing it with an electric system that was designed in the 1920s. And a lot of it runs on technology that's dial up telephone level. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to to get it really modernized. And if you modernize it, you can you can you can um, if you had the proper grid, you don't need all this new generation that people talk about. Even with all this electrification, they balance each other. But the but the big the big challenge here, and it's it 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 speaks to what Taylor said, and that is, how do you do this with equity? And there's no getting around the fact that all of this costs money. It saves money in in respects to certain things, but there are also expenditures, and that has an impact ultimately on um, on on on. Uh, lower income people as well as high income people. And so how do you balance the speed of investments that are necessary, but that need to be recovered from people in the state, and but make sure that that it's done in a way that's equitable and um, um, mitigates the impact on on certain levels of 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 society. And if you and that's the challenge, and that's it's probably a more complex problem than some of these technical things that I've been talking about. It's keeping that balance and making sure that um, you're really benefiting all levels of society to to get to that goal. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Jerry. We probably didn't talk quite enough about equity, but uh, next time we'll dive into that further. A um, couple more comments I want to read off before we close. From Scott Brown, notwithstanding Jerry's recent comments, I participated in a Zoom conference last week that posited that climate doomerism is outpacing climate change denial. Anecdotally, I hear this expressed by people in the 35 to 55 age group. Very important to disseminate and explain in readily understandable language the positive changes that have been accomplished and are in process. The graph about displaced natural gas use attributed to solar is very useful. Yeah. And we had a request for uh, for you to share the graphics that you shared here, um, Jerry. So if you have a way to email those to me, I can uh, get them I, up to the group. I actually put a link that people can go to and download the uh, the PowerPoint block. It, it yeah. actually you don't even have to download it; it'll it'll show up in your browser. Great, thank you. And Kiki Tidwell from the Climate Action Committee again says, "I'd like to mention too that the York Water District is opting into a solar farm and saving hundreds of thousands of dollars over the next twenty years. Great work." Um, so that's fantastic to hear. Thank you both, um, Taylor and Jerry, for sharing with us a lot of uh, good and hopeful progress that's being made and uh, some of the challenges as well. Um, thanks to Kiki and Wayne for rounding out the story with some news from the Climate Action Committee as well. Um, special thanks to York Public Library and York Land Trust for co-hosting these this series with us. And uh, one last plug for the Climate Action Fair on March 23rd at York High School from 10 to 2. If you're around, please stop by and see us. Uh, it's going to be a great day to learn more about how you can electrify your home or get involved with nonprofits. Um, there's going to be kids' activities and free snacks. So come and enjoy. Thanks for being here and take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.